everybody and welcome to the Rutgers University Geology Museum's late night event. Today we have our special theme which is Ice Age and so for you we have a trivia that we will be uh, doing first. So Lauren are you ready for the trivia? Yes I am. So let's get started. And so first we have, um, in order to play, you can scan the QR code here on the screen, or you can go to menti.com and enter this eight digit code, which is 92072052. And keep track of your score and let us know how you're doing um, at, the end of, um, at the end of our trivia. And if you are not able to join Menti, you can also um, post your question, uh, post your answers actually in the chat. Okay, so uh, Lauren, are you there? Because I can't hear you. Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have my special little helper with me, so. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. So the first question we have for you tonight is what is an ice age? A, a time when Earth is totally covered in ice. B, a time of colder than usual global temperatures. C, a time of average global temperatures. Or D, a time of warmer than usual global temperatures. All right, so we have a couple answers coming in. We have people picking A and B right now. Let's get another second or two. <clears throat> and it looks like most people are picking A as their answer. Okay, so let's find out. And it's B, a time of colder than usual global temperatures. So an ice age is a long period of cold temperatures that cause ice sheets and glaciers to grow. Next question, ice ages have occurred many times in Earth's history. So what causes an ice age to occur? Is it A, changes in the shape of the Earth's orbit around the sun? B, changes in the Earth's tilt? C, changes in the Earth's wobble as it rotates on its axis? Or D, all of the above? So right now we have answers coming in for B and D. Another second or two. And it looks like most people are saying D. Yep, D just pulled ahead a lot. So most people are saying D. Okay, so the correct answer is D, all of the above. The onset of an ice age is related to cycles and Earth's movement around the sun called Milankovitch cycles. Changes in the Earth's tilt and orbit change over time and affect which areas on Earth get more or less solar radiation. Question number three, ice ages alternate between times when it's really cold and glaciers grow, as well as times when it warms and glaciers recede. What do scientists call a period of time when glaciers recede? Is it A, interglacial period, B, recession period, C, melting period, or D, glacial period? All right, well, we have a nice spread for this. We've got A, B, and D as answers right now. A is slightly pulling ahead right now. Another second or two. And yes, most people are saying A for this question. Okay, so the correct answer is A, interglacial period. Temperatures fluctuate during an ice age and the earth alternates between interglacial periods, warmer periods when glaciers recede and glacial periods, which are colder periods when glaciers grow. Question four, how do scientists learn about past ice ages? A, by studying geological features of the land. 
B, by analyzing the chemical makeup of rocks, C, by studying fossils, or D, all of the above? All right, let's see. Uh, right now we have a couple answers for letter D. And sorry, that banging in the background is my 10 month old banging Hot Wheels cars together. So <laughs> it's keeping them from screaming. Uh, and we have one, a couple answers for A. So right now people are picking A and D, but D is the overwhelming majority right now. Okay, so the correct answer is D, all of the above. Scientists can reconstruct past temperatures by piecing together information from the types of fossils, composition of rocks, and features of the landscape. That's what my PhD is in and what Rhea's eventual PhD will be in too. That's what we do, what we study. Question number five, when did the most recent ice age end? A, 11,700 years ago, B, 40,200 years ago, C, 1 million years ago, or D, 5.2 million years ago? That was my fault. I forgot to hit reset. So go ahead, people, and pick your answers now. Oh, there they go. Sorry about that. Okay, so we've got question, answers for a and B right now, they're kind of dead even between A and B. And B is just slightly ahead of A at the moment. And yet B is still the, the majority at this point. Okay, so let's see. The correct answer is actually A, 11,700 years ago. The last ice age began 116,000 years ago and ended only 11,700 years ago. And again, if you are just joining us, we are doing an ice age trivia. So you can scan the QR code on the screen or you can go to menti.com and enter that eight digit code, which is on the screen. Uh, keep track of your score and we'll find out at the end how you did. Next question. But how much colder on average was the earth during the last ice age as compared to now? Five degrees Fahrenheit colder, B, 10 degrees colder, C, 15 degrees colder, or D, 20 degrees colder? All right, we've got pretty split, even split between A, C, and D right now. So most people are, oh, and there's one for B. So now we have all, all answers selected, but the majority right now is for C. Okay, so let's find out. The correct answer, answer is B, 10 degrees Fahrenheit colder. At the peak of the last ice age, massive ice sheets stretched over North America, reaching as far as northern New Jersey. And if you are familiar with central Jersey, I believe the edge or the end of the glacier was around where Woodbridge Mall is today. All right. Number seven, what time in Earth's history do scientists think was the coldest? A, 100,000 years ago. B, 500 million years ago, C, 2 billion years ago, or D, 5 billion years ago. Okay, wow. Dead even on all four answers right now. <laughs> so, yep, still pretty even. A and B are slightly pulling ahead right now. Yep, still even with A and B. Okay. So let's see. The answer actually is not A or B. It's actually C, 2 billion years ago. Scientists have found evidence that the Earth was completely frozen from the equator to the poles about 2 billion years ago. And this is called snowball Earth hypothesis. 
Number eight, which of these features was created by glaciers? A, the Hawaiian Islands, B, the Grand Canyon, C, Death Valley, or D, the Great Lakes? All right, we've got answers for A, B, and D right now. Pretty even still. Okay, now we have B and D pulling ahead. Oh, and there's another one for C, so we've got choices for all of them. But now D is the favorite answer. Okay, let's find out. The correct answer is actually D, the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes began to form um, at the end of the last ice age, about 14,000 years ago, as retreating ice sheets exposed the basins and they had to had carved into the land and the basins were filled with melt water from the ice sheets. I can tell you that the Grand Canyon actually was formed from the Colorado River. Um, so not a glacier that was formed from a river. Okay, next one is number nine. What term is used to describe large animals like the woolly mammoth and the woolly rhinoceros that lived during the ice age? A, microfauna, B, microflora, C, megafauna, or D, megaflora? Okay, we have answers for C and D right now. But overwhelmingly, people are picking letter C. Yeah, landslide for letter C right now. Okay. So the correct answer is C, megafauna. The word megafauna can be used to des describe large animals found in a particular habitat or ecosystem or during a specific geologic period. The cutoff for this term is usually a weight of uh, over 100 pounds. Number 10, which of these animals did not live during the last A, mastodons, B, wolves, C, camels, or D, dinosaurs? Okay, so we've got people answering C and D right now, but most people picking D. Okay, so the correct answer is D. Dinosaurs, except birds, died out at the end of the Cretaceous period about 65, so 65, actually 66 million years ago. So no dinosaurs during the last ice age. Um, I know many of you might have seen the Ice Age movies, and I think it was the, either the second or third one where they had the cute little baby T-Rexes hanging out with the mastodon, but not did not happen, right? Dinosaurs were not around during the Ice Age. And once again, if you are joining us for our ICH trivia, you can play by scanning the QR code or you can go to menti.com and enter the eight digit code. You can also write your answers into the chat if you like. Uh, keep track of your score and we'll, we'll see how you did. So we're gonna continue playing. Number 11, what is the name of this Ice Age animal? Is it A, American Lion? B, Glyptodon, C, Giant Ground Sloth, or D, Woolly Rhino? Okay, not many people answered yet. Wait for a couple more answers to come in. I think this guy was in Ice Age too, wasn't he? I think so. He was featured. Um, okay, so we've got some answers. We've got letter B, C, and D being picked. But right now, most people are saying letter B. Okay, so the correct answer is B, glyptodon. Glyptodons are an extinct group of heavily armored armadillo relatives that evolved in South America and eventually migrated into North America. They could grow to roughly the same size and weight as a Volkswagen Beetle. It's pretty big. All right, so the next question, number 12. What is the name of this Ice Age animal? Is this A, a saber-toothed cat, 
B, a dire wolf, C, American lion, or D, a giant ground sloth? All right, let's see. Couple, only a couple answers. Okay, so we have some people saying A, some people saying D. Uh, it's pretty even right now between A and D. Oh, a little bit more for D now. D is slightly ahead. Okay. So let's find out. Oh, right. All right, so here's the correct answer. It is D, giant ground sloth. Ground sloths were some of the largest land mammals of all time, standing up to 20 feet tall with claws up to 20 inches long. I can't imagine having claws or fingernails that long. That's really long. All right. Number 13. What is the name of this Ice Age animal? A, giant short-faced bear. B, saber-toothed cat. C, dire wolf. Or D, woolly rhino. All right, let's see. <clears throat> Only a few answers. Oh, it is dead even between all answers right now. <laughs> all right, we've got a few more. B is pulling slightly ahead right now. Oh, no, now I lied. It changed that quickly. A and B are even with C and D very close behind. So this, this is probably the most split answers I've seen tonight. <laughs> okay. So let's see. It's actually A, giant short-faced bear. Giant short-faced bears were the largest carnivorous land mammal to ever live in North America. They were roughly one and a half times the size of today's Kodiak grizzly bear. That is very big. Okay, so the next question is number 14. How long were the canine teeth of the famous saber-toothed cat also called the saber-toothed tiger? Was it A, two inches, B, five inches, C, eight inches, or D, 12 inches? All right, we've got answers for C and D right now. And now B and C are pretty much dead even. Oh, now, and this is another very split one. They're all very, very close, but C is a little tiny bit ahead of the other ones. Okay, so let's find out. The correct answer is C, eight inches. Most saber-toothed cats had canine teeth between six and eight inches long. That's very long. <laughs> okay, question 15. The Irish elk was the largest member of the deer family and is known for its giant antlers. How wide could their antlers reach? A, three feet, B, eight feet, C, 10 feet, or D, 12 feet? You can actually see a skeleton of one of these in Philadelphia, one of the museums there. So we have, a split between answers B and C right now. They're pretty even. I think other people are still thinking. B and C are still even, and a little bit behind is letter D. Okay. Well, get in your final answers, and I will show it to you now. And it is D, 12 feet. The impressive antlers of the Irish elk could span about 12 feet wide and weigh 100 pounds. Only one person picked D, so good job, whoever that one person was. <laughs> All right, so I, once again, we have a few more questions for our trivia. So um, to play, please scan the QR code or visit menti.com, enter that eight digit code. Okay, so let's continue on with our final round of questions. Which Ice Age creature survived the extinction event at the end of the last Ice Age and is still living today? Is it A, an American lion, B, musk ox, C, dire wolf, or D, cave bear?
All right, so we have <clears throat> uh, A, B, and D picked, um, but majority of people are saying letter B right now. Okay, so the correct answer is B for musk ox. Musk ox managed to survive the extreme climatic changes and the rise of humans that came with the end of the last ice age and still live today in the Arctic. Question 17. There were two main groups of large elephant-like animals that lived during the last ice age, the mastodons and the mammoths. What's the difference between them? A, mastodons were shorter and stockier than mammoths. B, mastodons ate woody vegetation while mammoths ate grass. C, mastodons had flatter heads while mammoths had distinctive knobs on top of their skulls. Or D, all of the above. All right, so we've got... It's my son again, voicing his displeasure. Some uh, one person picking letter B, and the rest of the people are picking letter D right now. Okay, so let's find out. So the correct answer for this one is D, all of the above. On the left side, there's a picture of a mammoth, and on the right, you can see a mastodon. So all of those differences, um, and although they do look similar, mammoths and mastodons are two different groups of animals. And they can most easily be told apart based on their teeth. Um, and a fun fact actually is um, Rome, people were finding mastodon skulls, but they didn't quite know what they were finding because if at the skull, since the trunk is a soft body part, it doesn't get preserved. So there was just a whole, big hole in the middle. Um, so they thought it was a one-eyed monster. And that's where the myth of the Cyclops actually comes from. All right, question 18, how tall did woolly mammoths grow to be? A, five to six feet, B, seven to eight feet, C, nine to 11 feet, or D, 17 to 18 feet? Mary, I think we lost Lauren. Give me a second. I'll see if I can find the, the answer. Yes, thank you. So if you are thinking about it, once again, your question is how tall did woolly mammoths grow to be? A, five to six feet. B, seven to eight feet. C, nine to 11 feet. Or D, 17 to 18 feet. It looks like the overwhelming majority has chosen C so far, but there are also a couple for D. Okay, so let's let's find out. And that is correct, C, nine to 11 feet. While woolly mammoths were quite large, Colombian mammoths were even larger, reaching up to 13 feet tall at the shoulder and weighing up to 22,000 pounds. Um, and in the picture, you can see the woolly mammoth is the blue, bigger there, and the Colombian mammoth is in red. So there's a size difference there. Question 19, which evolved first, the mastodon or the mammoth? Was it A, the mastodon, B, mammoth, C, they both emerged at the same time, or D, neither ever existed? All right, I'm back, I'm sorry. My internet just totally <laughs> went kaput on me. So I just reset the question for this. Okay, so we have people answering A, B, C for this one with A and C being the leader at the moment. Okay, so let's see. The correct answer for this is A, mastodon. Mastodons evolved around 23 million years ago while mammoths are a much younger group only evolving about 3 million years ago. And our last question for tonight is the Rutgers Geology Museum has a full mastodon skeleton on display 
What is its name? Is it A, Mac, B, Mark, C, Martin, or D, Manny? All right, we've got a couple responses, not too many yet. People are picking C or D right now. Oh, now we have all, all options picked. But D is pulling a little ahead with C close behind it. But now, yep, D is the most popular answer. Okay, so let's find out the correct answer actually is D, Manny. So Manny the Mastodon is actually named after Mannington, New Jersey, which is a town where he was discovered. And another fun fact, Manny was actually purchased for $300. Uh, this is back in the late 1800s. So um, I don't remember how much that is worth today. Definitely more, but um, that is Manny the Mastodon. And let's see how you all did. So how many questions did you get right? If you got zero to 10 correct, you are an ice age enthusiast. If you got 11 to 15 correct, you are a climate scientist. If you got 16 to 20 questions correct, you are a glacial biologist. And all of you can pat yourselves on the back because I think everyone did really well today. So thanks for playing. And um, we now actually have a craft activity, which I will be showing you what to do. So if you wanna go grab some supplies, here is what we're making. We're making a paper plate mammoth. Okay, so you'll need a paper plate. You will need construction paper, markers. Um, if you want, if you don't have construction paper, uh, you can use markers to color. You will need a pair of scissors. And you'll need some glue or tape. And once you are finished making your, I'm going to go through the steps of making this. And once you're done making it, you can scan that QR code. And that is our Padlet page where you can take a picture of your uh, of your mammoth and you can upload it there. So that and I'll show you all of that later too. So go ahead and get grab your supplies if you haven't already, and I will be showing you how to make this. So I'm just gonna stop sharing. Okay, and can everybody still hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. All right, so I did not have a paper plate, so that is okay if you don't have a paper plate. You can make this out of construction paper as well. So if you do have a paper plate, you can, your plate is gonna be the head, okay? And so I cut out a big circle from the construction paper. I'm gonna make mine colorful, colorful, colorful uh, mammoth, okay? So I'm making mine orange and it's gonna have some features of yellow, okay? And so I have the circle and the circle is going to be the head. And let me actually change this this way so it's easier for you to see. Okay, so I also have here, on white paper, I have drawn this shape here. You can draw it over again so you can see it better. And this is going to be the tusk. Those mammoths had these tusks and they're pretty curved. So I'm going to curve it out. And I actually folded the paper because we need two tusks. So I folded it so that I can cut it and I don't, you know, I'll have two tusks that I can use then. So that's why I folded the paper. And I have the tusks. And on my yellow paper, I wanted to make ears. So these are going to be two ears for my mammoth, which I haven't thought of a name yet, but maybe you can help me figure that out. And this is going to be the trunk. Okay. And so what I'm actually going to do now is I'm going to add some details to this. So while you all get your supplies ready and if you need to draw anything, it will give you some time to do that. So I am going to draw some lines here on the trunk. Okay. 
Okay. And I'm going to draw these two little nostrils here. And I think that is good. And since I, if you do have, um, if you have something fuzzy, you can definitely make, you can glue it or tape it on and make a fuzzy one. Um, if you have yarn or something, that would be really good. So since I don't, I'm gonna make these little V shapes to, to pretend that's the fur here. And to the ear. That's a little detail to represent that this guy has fur. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna cut it out now. So I'm gonna cut out all of my pieces. I actually only need one trunk. So I'm not gonna cut both of the pages since I folded it. And again, if you only have white paper, you can definitely color it in. You can make it a multicolored ma mammoth. Mine is gonna be pretty colorful. Um, so you can get as creative as you like. You can use markers, you can do anything you want. Okay, so the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut out the ears. So you can see that. And I'm gonna add details to my other ear too. Okay, and since I folded my paper, I have now the same shape on the other side, but I need to cut it in half. And I'm going to add some details like I did on this one to my other ear here. Okay, so I have my ears, I have a trunk. And I need to cut out the tusks now. Okay, so I got my tusks. And again, I have folded this, so I'm gonna cut it. And now I have two. So I'm gonna start to put together these pieces onto my mammoth, and I'm gonna use some tape. I'm gonna put together the ears first. Yeah. And now I'm going to Maria, I think you got muted. Oops, okay, sorry. Um so I was just saying that I'm going to put these tusks around uh here and then the trunk is going to go like this. So you can see how I'm going to I'm going to tape that down now. We want the tusks to be facing outwards like this.
Okay, this is pretty looking pretty good. I think my bastion, which I'm gonna put this ear, I'm gonna try to move it up. Okay, and the last thing that I need is actually eyes. Well, actually my mammoth needs eyes. So I'm gonna make, with the marker, I'm gonna make some nice eyes here. And if you have googly eyes, you can definitely use googly eyes. Okay, and I think it's all ready. So here is our woolly mammoth. And I think the colors I used look pretty good. So you can take a picture of your woolly mammoth once you're done and you can post it to the palette. So let's check out what you all have made. Let's see if um, anyone added any pictures yet. And if you see in the chat also, we put in the link um, and I'll share the screen again so you can see that QR code that you want, you can scan. Here's the QR code for the Padlet. And let's refresh this and see if there's anything there. Okay, so not yet. So it seems like you guys are still working on creating your paper plate mammoths and that is totally okay. If you need the instru um, if you need the supply list, it's here on the Padlet. There's a little example. Okay, so there's one example. And here are the parts that you would need. And again, if you you are making this, um, once you're finished, you can take a picture of it and you can post it to the Padlet so we can see your wonderful creations. And I can show you mine from a different view. There you go. Here's a better view of that. Okay, so um, Julie, do you think we're ready for, for the next segment or? Yeah, I think we're ready. Ted, are you there? I'm here. All right, if you wanna unhide your camera, there you are. We can start sharing. Okay, everyone. So um, thank you for making the craft. And now if, you, if you're not finished, you can definitely finish that and be sure to take a picture and share it with us. Um, but now we have a special uh, talk. And so uh -huh. we have Ted Pellis and he will be speaking to us today. So um, Ted, you can take it away. Um, I'm having a little trouble sharing my screen at the moment. Go to the bottom of the Zoom window and you should see a green button that says share. One second. Oh, got it. Thank you. How's that look? Seen it yet? That looks good. And then you just have to find that present button again. Okay. There you go, perfect. Okay, ready? Yep, you can go ahead. Thanks, Ted. Okay, uh, 
Hi, everybody. Just want uh, my name is Ted Pallas. I work at the New Jersey DEP, the uh, New Jersey Geological Survey, and I wanted to give a little talk on New Jersey mastodons tonight. Um, about three years ago, I did a report on um, all of the, the mastodon discoveries and um, in New Jersey, and I put it into the report and I wrote a little bit about the history and and what happened in New Jersey, how they were found and things like that. Okay, so what is a mastodon? Mastodon is a large extinct elephant-like animal. They had a coat of reddish brown fur and tusks. The scientific name for New Jersey mastodons is Mammut Americanum. Uh, Mammut comes from the Greek word Earth burrow, burrower. Uh, it was because in the Middle Ages, tusks were unearthed in Europe, and they were thought to um, to be from earth burrowing creatures. Or they were actually mastodons. Um, Ma American mastodons were among the largest living land animals during during the Ice Age in New Jersey. <clears throat> the, the earliest elephant uh, was not the mastodon. It was traced back to the Erytherium, the earliest extinct proboscidean, which was animals with trunks. Erytherium is the oldest, smallest, and most primitive known elf rel elephant relative. They originated in Northern Africa near Morocco. And there's a picture on the right. Uh, here's the Mastodon family tree. Um, so you go back 60 million years to the uh, Erytherium and you go up to the right, and you follow it. Um, the first red one is the is the ma mammoth, which is the mastodon, and uh, went extinct about ten thousand years ago. And the mammoth was actually uh, lived a lot longer, only up until about thirty six hundred years ago. But that also went extinct. And um, as you see, the two blue ones are the living elephants that we still have today. Uh, there are different between mastodons and mammoths. Um, to the left is a mastodon. Uh, they were browsers. And to the right, you have the mammoths, which were grazers. Uh, mastodons have, have straighter tusks and pointier teeth, while mammoths have curled tusks and flat teeth for chewing um, grasses. Here's a picture of the mastodon on the right teeth on and mammoth on the left. Uh, if you can see the, the mammoth tooth is, is pretty flat and is for grinding the grains, whereas the mastodon on the right, you can see these lumps and bumps. So they were grinding uh, twigs and uh, sticks for their, for their diet. Uh, both of these teeth are on display at the New Jersey State Museum. So come, Mastodon's coming to America. Um, it is widely thought that Mastodon's reached North America about 23 million years ago by way of Siberia and the Bering Strait land bridge in the Miocene epoch. You can see the picture on, on the right um, is where they, they crossed. Um, the Mastodon of, of North America thrived in woody, swampy environments and when it was sufficiently cold, they range as far south as Central America as well as Florida and other warmer areas when it was colder at the time during the Ice Age. Mass Massons are considered the most famous of New Jersey's Ice Age mammals. Massons lived during the Pleistocene or Ice Age, which lasted from about 2.6 million to about 12,000 years ago. And, in, and they lived into the beginning of the Holocene period, which is uh, the current period. Uh, they are herbivores. They make mostly twigs, cones, branches, of spruce trees, which cover New Jersey when they lived here. Mastodon remains have been discovered in 13 of New Jersey's 21 counties. Uh, New Jersey Mastodon migration and habitat. The map on the right shows all of the 52 documented Mastodon fossil uh, discoveries in New Jersey. The blue line shows the southern extent of the Wisconsin glacier. Uh, you can see here across Northern New Jersey and out onto Long Island. Um, during the Ice Age, Mastodons lived south of the glacier, which covered the uh, northern part of the state. And they mig the Mastodons mi would migrate north as the uh, glacier melted and retreated into Canada 
And as you can see, there's, you know, there's mastodons out into the Atlantic Ocean, and that's not because they were swimming, but because the shoreline of New Jersey during the Ice Age was 70, 80 miles farther out offshore because a lot of the water of the ocean was um, locked up in the, in the frozen um, glaciers during the Ice Age. So there was more, more land that they could, they could roam. Mastodons during the Ice Age in New Jersey. Uh, during the last glacial period, parts of New, northern New Jersey, including around High Point, were under an ice sheet nearly two, almost two miles thick. So this picture is from um, American Museum of Natural History in New York, showing um, um, mastodon and mammoths um, roaming the land. And this could be from, say, you know, with a little imagination, maybe Southern Morris County, um, Warren County, Somerset County, you know, the, you know, the, the Macedons roaming around into the north where the two mile thick glaciers were, could have been like, in the distance. So dates from New Jersey Macedon fossil records range from 12,730 years to 10,995 years ago. These were um, seven or eight um, dated Macedon bones. Um, most were done, done by radiocarbon. Some were done by, say, like the peat surrounding the Macedon or a Native American encampment. Um, so the, the time when the Macedons were in New Jersey, according to the, the limited information of dating we have on Macedons, was only about 2,000 years, even though they lived, you know, much longer life. You know, I mean, they were around for maybe 30 million years. Um, but they were only in New Jersey for a short time. And um, at least that's what the data shows that we uh, collected. So New Jersey Mastodon discoveries. Um, all of the mostly complete Mastodon skeletons in New Jersey were found in North Jersey, preserved in peat bogs. In South, South Jersey, where it was drier, mostly only teeth and bones were found. South Jersey bones having been widely scattered by animals after the animal died. There were lack of peat bogs to preserve the fossils in place in the southern part of the state. Uh, one exception was the Mannington Mastodon found in Salem County, where an almost complete skeleton was found in a marl pit. So the, uh, the Mannington Mastodon was found in Mannington Township, um, New Jersey. Today, this mastodon skeleton is on display at the Rutgers Geology Museum. And you can see on the, on the right is a picture of it. Um, the Manny Mastodon is the only full mastodon skeleton currently on display in New Jersey today. A uh, little bit of history of the Manny to Mastodon discovery. Um, marl was a valuable fertilizer rich in calcium and carbonated lime. Um, it was found in many places in New Jersey, in, in the South Jersey, uh, and this is where the Mannion Mastodon was discovered on August 27, 1869. The skeleton soon became a money-making curiosity. It went on display at, a, at a, a spot near the Eastview Cemetery in Salem, where a 10-cent admission was charged to enter a tent to see the Mastodon, according to newspaper accounts of the day. The Mastodon skeleton went, then went to the Bridge and Fair. The local newspaper, the Salem Sunbeam newspaper reported 3,000 people paid to see it. Eventually, the New Jersey state childist at the time, George H. Cook, bought the skeleton for $300 and it was mounted on display at the Rutgers Geology Museum in, 18, it's in 1896, where it remains the centerpiece of the museum today. Uh, so a little bit about the Rutgers Geology Museum and the Bannington Mastodon. It was mounted in 1896 at Rutgers College as the university was known at the time. It occupied a space of eight by 20 feet at the north end of the room. The vintage photo on the right shows a skeleton of the Bannington Mastodon on display in the Rutgers Geology Museum in New Brunswick in 1931. So there were many other uh, notable Mastodon discoveries in New, New Jersey. And another very famous one was called the Oberg Mastodon. 
On the picture on the right, you can see excavation of the Oberg Mastodon specimen in Vernon, New Jersey in Sussex County uh, in February of 1954. It was discovered when Us Gus Oberg was having a pond dug with a dragline excavator in his uh, property he wanted to build a pond. People from Rutgers University, Princeton University, the New Jersey State Museum, the New Jersey Geological Survey, and others all took part in the digging of the bones and all these groups are represented in the picture here on the right. It was the most complete mass on skeleton ever discovered in New Jersey. Um, it was reconstructed and put on display in the New Jersey State Museum for many years. Uh, in this picture, Archibald McMur McMurtry on the left was the excavator digging the pond at the time, and Gus Oberg, he's on the right. He was the owner of the pond, and they're proudly showing their uh, leg bone of the mastodon they found while digging the pond. Um, originally, Gus Oberg wanted to try and sell the, uh, the mastodon bones, but he eventually decided he rather donated to the museum um, in, in for science, so, so all the people of the state could enjoy and um, they can go see it anytime. So when, after bones are, bones of masses on are found, it, they have to be conserved and prepared before they go on display at say the um, Rutgers Geology Museum or uh, the New Jersey State Museum. Picture here on the right is the Oberg Mastodon um, it's at the Museum of Natural History in New York in the 50s. And you can see the conservators are um, uh, putting it together at this point, but they had to treat the bones so they wouldn't um, degrade and uh, they had to get them ready to go on display. So it was a big job. You know, once the bones were excavated, there was still a lot of work to get it ready to go to the museum. Um, for Oberg Mastodon, here is a um, advertisement back from the 1950s when it went, uh, was there, it was a big deal. Um, so they, wanted, they had a lot of people come in and they were very um, proud to have the, the Mastodon there. Another uh, notable Mastodon find was uh, the Bojack Mastodon. It was discovered on the Bojack property in Liberty Township, Warren County in uh, the early 1970s, 1971, during the construction of another pond. And as you can see, that's a common theme, finding mastodon bones, um, because these ponds were um, usually peat bogs, you know, 10,000 years ago when the mastodons were walking around, maybe moving north as the glaciers melted. And uh, they would roam into these uh, peat bogs and they were very sticky and they would get stuck and they would you know eventually die they couldn't get out and over the years you know they they were totally encased in this peat and their bones were preserved and animals would not be able to rip it apart and that's why you know the northern mostly the northern uh, mastodons were better preserved and available when found um this on the left it was a picture of when the, the jawbone of the bojack mastodon was excavated and on the right is how it is now, it's on display at the New Jersey State Museum. Disappearing mastodons. Okay, so no one knows for sure why mastodons disappeared, but it's thought that rapid climatic swings at the end of the ice age accompanied by habitat shifts might have played a part. Uh, the spruce forest, which mastodons fed on, disappeared from New Jersey as the glaciers migrated northward and the land dried up. The climate also got warmer, which the Mastodons didn't like, and this caused increased competition for food. Some also say hunting by humans could have played a part in their extinction, and you know the early indigenous peoples overlapped sometime with the Mastodons uh, before the Mastodons died out. And um, if you look at the map on the right, um, you know it shows a lot of the Mastodon uh, discoveries in New Jersey. But if you look to the north of um, where the glaciers were. As the glaciers melted and retreated northward towards Canada, the Mastodons left New Jersey and they would march northward in, in a narrow gap between the mountains and the Hudson River. And this is one, uh, you know, Orange County, New York is one of the major areas in North America for Mastodon 
uh, discoveries. Uh, many have been found there, many well preserved. Um, that's because, you know, the, they had peat bogs also there and, and they had a large concentration of mast mastodons going through there. So that also contributed. So um, where can you find a mastodon in New Jersey today? Um, there are five spots uh, where you can, uh, four spots. The Mangan Mastodon, of course, is at the Rutgers University Geology Museum in New Brunswick. Um, the most famous one right there. Uh, Mo is located at the Sussex County Historical Museum in Newton. Um, I know the museum is open on Fridays and they don't have a complete skeleton, but they have uh, many of the bones. And like the Oberg Mastodon and uh, the Bojack, Mo was also discovered while they were digging a pond in, in the Newton area. And, uh, you know, they pulled the, the bones out of the pond and Luckily that uh, the people doing it were, um, you know, they, they knew, knew what they needed to do. They got the bones and they tried to preserve them before um, the museum people could get there. But uh, they have a nice display at that museum in Sussex County and in Newton, if you ever want to go check that out. Um, so there are some Warren County Macedons, Macedon, Macedon bones from the 1800s on display at the Newark Museum. Uh, also, not a complete skeleton, but they do have some, some bones there, and uh, that's another place you can go. Um, the Bojack Mastodon from Liberty Township are in this are on this bones are on display also at the State Museum, and um, there are various Mastodon teeth which were found offshore in the Atlantic Ocean on display at the New Jersey State Museum, and a lot of the teeth found offshore were either by um, oyster dredges when they would, um, clam dredges, they're digging up the, the shells uh, to harvest and they would also dig the teeth up would be um, lying on the floor because the mastodons when they die, they just, the teeth just like laid around. Um, and also like ge uh, United States Geological Survey did other geological studies out in the ocean and they would um, bring some up sometimes also. So, um, you know, those are the museums where you can go see one if you want. Um, so the report I did uh, back in 2019, it's called Garden State Mastodons. It's um, the web, if, if anybody's interested, the web address is on the screen there and you can go check it out. And it just talks about um, a lot of stuff I mentioned and plus more of including, um, you know, all the discoveries that were, were documented. And questions? Thank you, Ted. Um, so the Google Doc has a lot of questions for you. Okay. So, uh, I'm, just, I'm trying to find how I get to that at the moment. Can you maybe read? I'm not. I'm having trouble finding uh, the Google Doc at the moment. Maria, do you want to read the questions? Maybe that'll be a little easier. Oh, just give me one second. Sorry about that. Pull it up for you. All right. So the first question we have here for you, Ted, is how do we know the color of mastodon fur from fossils? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure, but I'm I'm not sure. It could be that they found some somewhere that still had the the fur on uh, the mastodon, but I'm not quite sure. Yeah, it's a, I'm not sure about that one. Okay, so the next question we have for you, actually it was a question from my mom. Um, are mammoths and mastodons ancestors of modern elephants? And then her other question was like, what are the tusks made out of? Are they made out of ivory? That's a good question too. I'm not sure. I mean, I would assume they are. 
you know, being an elephant, it's probably a good, a good, a good guess. Okay, and I think I see a question here from Gina. And Gina would like to know what sparked your interest in studying mastodons and mammoths? Oh, okay. So um, I, I work at the Geological Survey and we, um, we have an extensive uh, file system and um, Geological Survey goes back to 1836. And my office was always involved in uh, fossil research and things of that type. If there was any kind of uh, you know, new finds, people from my office would go. And um, I was reading through some of the files at one point. I noticed the Mastodon file was quite big and I got really interested. The more I would read the articles and, the, you know, the press clippings and things like that, I really got into it. And uh, so I, you know, went to my, my bosses and I said, look, you know, we have a lot of stuff here that maybe the, the public might want to know. If I put it together in a report, um, and they're like, yeah, go for it. And so that's how I got started. So the next question we have is, do you have, um, do you have a favorite New Jersey Mastodon fossil? Oh, uh, well, I like the Manning Mastodon because it's complete, you know, and other ones are nice. You know, but you could see one that's totally together, intact. You can go stand underneath it and you look up at it and how huge it is. And it's pretty, pretty awesome. So I really like that. I haven't seen the other mastodons, but many is my favorite so far also. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So have any woolly rhinos been found in New Jersey? I don't know about, I don't, I, uh, as far as I know, no, there's been woolly mammoths. Um, but as far as I know, no woolly rhino. But there are some, um, I'm going to say I'm, I don't think so, but maybe. Oh, okay, I'm muted. Okay. Um, so do you know, um, so like of all the mastodon fossils that uh, were found in New Jersey, um, do you know, I think you mentioned this, but are any of them on display in museums in and around New Jersey? Yeah, you have the, the Mannington at the Rutgers Geology Museum. You have the, the Sus Sussex County Historical Museum in Newton has a display of, of bones, uh, quite a few tusks, uh, head, things like that. Ruck, uh, the Newark Museum um, has a display of some bones from one in Warren County. It used to be one, there's a nature center at the Wachung Reservation. They had a bunch of teeth and other bones, but they closed down the exhibit about 10 years ago and shipped their stuff to the state museum. Um, the state, the Oberg Mastodon isn't on display anymore at the state museum. Um, after like 20, 30 years, they had some issues with uh, preservation. So they had to like take it down and put it in storage until they can, you know, conserve it again. So they just have random bones and teeth there. They don't have a complete mastodon anymore. Okay, and for for the ones that you mentioned that were found like in the not in the ocean, the ones um, those mastodon fossils uh, were they only the isolated teeth and bones? Yes, yes. Um, that's all. There were complete ones. There were, were no complete ones in the ocean. Mostly just bones. You know, not bones, but I mean not teeth. So there's a question from Ryan Nipple and he would like to know, well, first of all, he says hi to you and um, he's asking if you remembered him. Um, yep, definitely. And, and he would like to know, if, um, but there are two missing Ice Age elephant skeletons. Um, so what would happen to fossils when they are exposed like to the elements? Um, you know, that when they're in the, say underground or in the peapod, they're preserved, right? And uh, once the air hits them, they start to the bones start to deteriorate and become brittle, and you know they're going to get soft. So that was a big problem with the, with the Oberg mastodon when they found it in uh, Vernon. You know the the man who found it, he was uh, first he tried, wanted to sell it, you know, try to make some money, and 
you know, he wasn't getting the offers he wanted. So he had in his garage for like a month, you know, or a little longer. And, you know, the, the museum ex experts noticed the bones are starting to like decompose a little bit and get soft. And they told him, look, you know, you had to make a decision because if you keep this here, you know, they put special like shellac back in the day. I guess they put a little shellac and stuff on the bones to prevent um, deterioration. So he had to, you know, that's when he decided, okay, I'm going to give it to the museum. So, um, you know, that's basically what happens. Um, the ones in, few in Warren County were found in the 1800s. A lot of them disappeared because they, they didn't know what to do with them at the time and they, they decomposed. So those are, some of the remaining ones are at the New York Museum, but not all those bones survived. Um, okay, and um, so do you know like how long that actually, I know you mentioned some of the, the conservation process, do you know approximately like how long that would take? To, to, uh, I think from what I read, it was um, um, six to nine months, you know, once they got all the bones, mm -hmm. transported them, worked on them individually, they had to clean them up, you know, put the uh, preservative on them. Uh, and then numbered them and put them back in place. So it was, it was, you know, I think it probably took for the Oberg maybe at least a year before they got it on display from when they found it. So we have a question from um, Anthony, and you would like to know how, how rare are mammoth and mastodon fossils in New Jersey? They're um, rare, but not like, not super rare, you know. Um, there have been 52 mastodons discovered in New Jersey. I a, a few, a much much less mammoths. I don't know the exact number, but I'm going to say like less, you know, 10ish maybe around 10. Um, but the 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 most of the mastodon discoveries have been in the Midwestern United States, like uh, up by the Great Lakes, like Ohio, Indiana, that area, and then New, you know New Jersey has quite a few, and then also Southern New York State has a real lot, you know, but. So they're not super rare, but they're, you know, it's not like an everyday find. Um, so someone would like to know, actually, did, uh, did mastodons roar? Like, you know, if they, do we know what they sounded like? <laughs> oh, I don't know. We, you know, really, no, there's no written, you know, record because, you know, the humans who are around and aren't around. I would say it's like an elephant. So maybe, you know, and, you know, they have, they make noises and roar, so it pro probably, I would say. But uh, what did mammoths and mastodons eat? So the mammoths ate uh, grasses, like, you know, like um, tall grasses, like you see in the field in the summertime, that kind of uh, vegetation. And they, their teeth were flat, so they can really chew, them, chew it and grind it. The mastodons ate twigs, uh, you know, sticks, bark, um, more like woodier type plants. So yeah, they had different different diets. So what um, did uh, did giant ground sloths live in New Jersey too? They did. There were some. Yep, there were some discoveries. Yeah. Do you know where where they were discovered or like which place? Um, I do actually. I made a map of some. Place to see discoveries. Um, I'd have to look at it. I can get back to. Get yeah, back that's to. fine. Okay. Okay, and um, so we have a lot of questions coming in now. Um, so, what else have you studied besides mastodons and mammoths? Oh, uh, I do a lot of different things. So, um, in the past, I, 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 um, I'm the, cre uh, the creator of art. We have a, a New Jersey landslide database. So I map all the landslides in the state when they occur and I categorize them. And uh, I did a report about 10, 12 years ago on this landslides. Um, and I make that, it's available to the public, you know, our database. Um, I did a big study recently. It's in, almost published yet, but not quite on New Jersey Springs. So um, just mapping all the springs that we could find. I had, you know, five coworkers of my, myself and I did the report. And we did a study, we picked 14, and we analyzed the, the water quality in the springs. Um, right now, 
ongoing. I have a couple reports I'm working on. One is Amber um, in New Jersey, um, and which is like, you know, a tree sap that uh, sometimes would, uh, would encase insects and things like that, you know, 30 million years ago. Um, Sayreville was a big area for Amber. And um, uh, so I just, I'm writing a report about that. And also I'm working on a report of measuring all the state's waterfalls. Uh, and I'm gonna go to all of them and, and measure them and write about it and take pictures. And so it's a, you know, a lot of varied, a lot of different things. I work at the geological survey, anything related to geology and, you know, paleontology we're into doing. And so we get a lot of, I get a lot of options. So that's just, that's just like, you know, some of the things I worked on. Really interesting. And um, we actually got even more questions now. Everyone's interested about your work. So I'll read all of them to you. Okay. Uh, so what is your typical day at work like? Well, um, you know, I'm really lucky. I can go to work and do something different and interesting every day. Um, you know, so like today, I do. I also do another project where you know I got interested in the Macedon information because part of my job I do um, projects called data preservation, and it's a, it's a yearly grant that we get to preserve our paper data, like we get from the U.S. Geological Survey, and we have a lot of. Uh, historical documents. So we scan digitally. So, you know, if there's a fire, the building burns down, we don't lose it, it'll be saved, you know. So uh, I work on that part of my day. Um, like I'll work on my water, whatever report I'm working on at the time, like right now it's the amber and the waterfalls in the past, you know, was the mastodons and other and landslides and other things. Um, and uh, so yeah, it depends what, you know, what's going on at the moment. Uh, like I get to do field work, you know. Um, so one, once every couple of weeks, I'll go out in the field with uh, whatever I'm doing, you know, like locating the spring. We have a spring, the springs database. We're just continually updating that or I'm going out to see a, uh, a landslide or a waterfall at the moment. So it, it all depends, you know, how things are going. And, you know, um, that's, that's, how it, that's what a typical day is. Okay, and um, so there are a lot of questions about the landslides here. So how often do landslides occur in New Jersey? Uh, there's, there's, I'd say from like one to 15 or 20 per year, depending on the weather. Um, some years you might get one, like this 2021 was a really active year because of Hurricane Ida in September. Uh, I forget what the rainfall amount was, but it was pretty bad. Um, and there was like eight or nine really big ones, uh, a bunch affected houses. Um, so it depends on like hurricane season, really, and nor'easters. Um, uh, you know, every few years there's a big storm and we get a lot. There was a lot of them are cause a lot of damage. It's, you know, people don't really reckon, not really associate New Jersey with landslides because they don't really make the newspaper and people aren't aware of them. Because they usually hit a, lo a local area, like one house gets demolished or a small area gets in, you know, has a problem. But um, it, it's a big problem. And, you know, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage usually a year from them. You know, uh, there's a lot of rock falls along roadways, um, different places. So it's, it's, a, it's an act, you know, New Jersey has some steep cliffs up on the Palisades on the Hudson River. There's some really big ones. And it was like 2012, there was a huge one. Um, luckily, you know, no one was hiking on the trail below, but it was, it was big and you know, no one got hurt. There was no damage, but there's a lot. And um, so have you ever encountered any like houses or buildings that, like when you were out doing field work that were on unstable land, like because of like landslides? Have you ever seen that? Yeah, yeah. There was one up in, uh, it's called in Mountain Lake. It's in Warren County. and um, there was a, I forget what year it was, maybe 2015, 14, a uh, big hurricane, 10 inches of rain, and the house actually eventually collapsed because the, the land underneath it uh, collapsed. Um, and, you know, 
three or four houses around it had to be evacuated. The house had to be, you know, demolished. So, um, you know, yeah, it's, and there was a couple in Lodi a few years ago where, you know, the houses were undermined, you know, so. And uh, what is the, the biggest waterfall in New Jersey? You mentioned waterfalls, so someone uh, is interested in that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's up on the Hudson River, uh, Hudson River on the Palisades. Um, it's 250 feet tall. Um, I forget the name of it at the moment, but uh, yeah, it's not a com it's not one complete cascade. It's like three, but it's continuous fall, so it's 200 250 high. That's not the not the Patterson one, right? Patterson is seventy seven feet. Oh wow! Okay, so this is bigger. But it's yeah, pa but Patterson has the largest uh, gallons of water in the state, and it's it's the largest um, east, a uh, second largest besides Niagara, east of the Mississippi in terms of water flow. So Patterson's big in a different way. It's not tall as tall, but it's it's volume of water. So there's another question about waterfalls. So um, someone noticed that there's more like waterfalls like in the north part of the state, but not so much in southern Jersey. Like, is there any reason for that? Uh, yeah, all the, the mountains are in the northern part of the state and uh, geology has a lot to do with it. Um, the harder rock, which doesn't erode, it's more prone to, um, you know, waterfalls because um, you have the steep cliff and it will go over. Um, where South Jersey, it's like mostly sandy, clay soils. And there's one in Tinton Falls, which is pretty nice. It's like, you know, almost 10 feet tall. Um, but that's about it, you know, for South Jersey, you know, most are north of Trenton, New Brunswick area. So it's, it's really a geology and topography. So you mentioned amber. Uh, do you, like, are, is there enough amber, like, for people to actually make anything out of them? I know, like, people make jewelry. And how old are the amber deposits? Uh, like, um, like uh, 30 million years in New Jersey. Um, I think New Jersey is, like, when I, you know, my research, research is, like, one of the, it's, like, the second most productive place. Uh, Lithuania, I think, or Estonia might be the main one. Um can you make, it was a question, can you make jewelry out of it or? Like, do people do it? Like, do they do anything? Like, do I they have... use it to, um, do they use it to make anything out of it or? Uh... Um, you know, I'm not sure about that end of it for the New Jer Jersey Amber. Um, I'm assuming they do. I mean, I think I see it all over the place. And, you know, um, I think the New Jersey Amber was a little more brittle than other parts of the world. So, but um, it, it looks like you could, yeah. I, I, so I don't see why not. I think they probably have. And um, Julie, our bug expert, wants to know, are insects found in New Jersey amber? Oh, yes. Uh, ants. I don't, I don't have the paper in front of me, so I can't give you the scientific name. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, one of the earliest ticks was found in New Jersey amber, maybe the oldest tick. Um, but there's some dispute and they think maybe a bird from South America brought it here, but, um, uh, so yeah, definitely ant. the earliest ant I think is also in New Jersey Amber. Wow. Okay. And, um, so what is your favorite place, uh, that you've visited so far for field work? Oh my gosh. It's a hard uh, question. <laughs> I mean, no, oh, there's so many beautiful places in, in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Buttermilk Falls up in Sussex County is pretty cool. You know, mm -hmm. if anybody's ever been there, you know, if you haven't, it's worth a trip. Um, you know, the Paris of Falls is amazing. I like mm -hmm. going there. Um, there's a waterfalls in, uh, I think it's uh, Milburn, West Orange, it's called Hemlock Falls. Um, it's in uh, Watchung Reservation, no, uh, South Mountain Reservation. And it just has a really nice setting. It's like maybe 25 feet tall, but it's, you know, um, it's beautiful. And that's a really, I like going back there when I can. And um, another question is, have you ever seen any snakes while doing field work? And if yes, what kinds? Uh, I don't recall snakes. 
I don't think, I mean, I've seen it around my yard, but I don't, I haven't seen many doing any field work. Um, mostly just garter snakes. And uh, have you seen any bears? I saw one bear during field work and actually it was in a car and it ran, it ran in front of me across the road. So and I don't know. Where, where was that? This was in um, West Milford Township in Passaic County uh -huh. on route, uh, along Route 23. Mm. Yeah, so I never saw it. Well, I mean, I'm shocked because sometimes you go a mile into the woods and you, know, you never know, but I never never saw one in the, during field work in the woods, just driving to get there. Yeah, well, thank you. I think that's the end of uh, the questions. I don't think I missed any, but uh, that was a lot of questions. Thank you so much. That was very informative and, and very, uh, very cool, very interesting. So thank you so much for taking the time and, and speaking to us tonight. And thank you to our audience for joining us tonight. Um, and mark your calendars for April 21st at 6 p.m. We will have our next museum event, um, which will be our Ask a Geologist series. So the topic for the event will be geologic faults and folds and other really cool geologic features. Um, so Dr. Barry Hanafi will, is an assistant teaching professor um, at Rutgers in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department. And he will be discussing these features and what they mean for the landscape. So don't forget um, April 21st at 6 p.m faults and folds. And thank you once again, Ted. Um, that was really great. And have a good night, everybody.